I came from this community. I was one of you at one point in time. I mean, and, and, and I still am. However, I work in museums rather than academia like most of you do. Uh, and I, I happened to enter that world by happenstance. I was shooting a documentary at a museum and was invited in because they were looking for somebody to lead their new media department. And I stepped over from academia into museums, which is also another form of academia, not to, not to mix the world too much. But I wanted to share with you a little bit behind the walls of museums and the kind of the struggles that I've had in trying to move from my world of education and academia to the world of teaching within particularly an art museum and talk a little bit about, I'm going to move this conversation more from high tech to more about storytelling and, and different ways of looking at, at things. Um, but I, we'll, we'll come back full circle and I think you're going to all find something in this that, that you'll find interesting. So when I started working in museums, I was a fan of museums, but I was really a fan of science museums. And the thing that started to fascinate me right away was the difference between an art museum and a science museum. This is where science starts. This is the, the clean room at JPL. It starts in a pretty sterile environment and highly controlled. But when we interpret science, it ends up in a lively environment. This is, this is at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum. But it ends up in a much more interactive, lively, and engaging environment. This is where art starts. Does this look like an art museum? This is Calder's studio. And this is the thing that fascinates me because I hang around with a lot of artists. And I'm fascinated by how when we look at where our art starts, and then we look at where art ends up, basically in the scientific clean room, what a drastic difference there is. And this is one of the big struggles that, that you know, I have in trying to tell stories because I'm supposed to tell stories in a clean room environment. So I want to just take you on a little journey with just a, a painting. This is a, this is a painting called uh, The Virgin of the Immaculate Conception. And um, this is how it's displayed in the museum. It's, it's hung on the wall, a white wall up pretty high, it's got a tiny little label next to it, this is the education program about this work of art. And the education program about this work of art says that it was painted by Giovanni Castiglione in, in 1650. It's oil on canvas, it's 144 inches by 110 inches, and it, was, it has an accession number of some number. Uh, how many of you know what an accession number is? Good, that's, that's actually not too bad. An accession number is basically the museum's inventory number, but it actually is, is usually encoded, and if you go and look at it, you'll see that it actually has the, day, a day, the year and the number of, and a number following the year, which indicates which number of art, when that work of art was bought by the museum, what number that year it was bought in. So if it says 1967.3, it's the third work of art bought in 1967. Anyways. I actually think that number can be interesting if we tell the public a little bit more about it. It's one of the stories we don't tell. The other thing that's on this label, there also the other thing I didn't mention was, was the donor's name. This particular label is considered to be very special because it has a paragraph of text after it, which many labels in art museums don't even have that. And what this paragraph of text tells us is that this painting was painted for a small church in Osimo, Italy, uh, and it was uh, given by a wealthy patron to the, it was commissioned by a wealthy patron to the church and it hung on an altar. That's what, that's what, you know, what we know. So how many of you are going to stand around and look at this for a long time? That's, that's, that's my feeling as well. I mean, and this is the way art museums pretty much try to teach. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why they do that later. But let's just take a different approach and cut a door in the gallery wall and say, let's go travel back and actually visit this painting in that church. Now, I'm going to make you use your imaginations here. But if we go back to that church in Osimo, Italy, we see a painting hanging on an altar. It's hanging up really high. And 
The first thing that we would think if we were back in that time is, this is the most awesome plasma screen I've ever seen because this is new media. This, in, in 1650, this painting, which is 10 feet by 12 feet, is huge. And it was really hard to paint paintings that were that big back then. Previously, everybody was painting on wood panels and you could never make a painting that big. But here, all of a sudden, we have a painting that's huge because they're using new high-tech materials called canvas and they're stretching it. They're also using oil, oil paints, which are pretty new. Although the oil paints had to be made by hand, the pigments had to be collected, but oil paint was really high tech at that point in time. This is new media. It looks to us, it's, you know, everybody has paints. You can go to the art store. It's, there's nothing unusual about this. But back then it was. How was this, you know, what was this church like? Well, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have air conditioning. This was lit by candles and oil lamps. This painting was, was there was no AC. It was, the, the, it was subject to temperature fluctuations, humidity, all sorts of things that we now take for granted in our everyday lives. Then, so it was installed in the church in 1650. The church eventually, for one reason or another, was torn down and the painting was removed from there. And it traveled to another city where the people, the family who actually had originally commissioned it uh, lived. Well, how did it travel? It had to be rolled up had to be carried in a donkey cart or a, ho a horse and buggy or you know probably not even a horse and buggy at that point in time probably some kind of wagon and then it sat in that you know it was in that those people's possession for another 200 years we're still talking 150 years ago eventually it made it to an art dealer and eventually it made it to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and it's hung on the wall there okay so there's that story I personally think just that, and the fact that this painting, which is made of just fabric and early oils, still is surviving, is an amazing story. But do museums tell that story? Never. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Let's cut another door on the wall and talk about what we don't see in museums as well. There's a whole nother story about the works of art in museums, and I think this is the biggest shame as far as museums are concerned, is that they're like Disneyland. You know how Disneyland has the underground tunnels and that you, know, you only see the tip of the iceberg because the whole infrastructure and the magic of Disney is hidden? For some reason, art museums think that's a good thing for them too. There, you walk in and the only people you see, and people actually don't like this too much, is you see the guards, who are usually intimidate people, and you see the front desk people, and if you're really lucky, you'll see a tour guide. But that's pretty much all you ever see in a museum. But if you look at the museum's staffing chart, there's literally hundreds of people that work in most, me most medium or large museums, and they have all sorts of really interesting jobs. Things that the public would think were really interesting if they actually knew what was going on. So, the next thing that happened to this work of art when it came to the museum is it went into art storage. Now, how many of, what, what percentage do you guys think of art in an art museum is, is in art storage and what is on display? It, it's, well, in most museums, it's 95% of the art is in storage. So you're just seeing a tiny little tip of the iceberg. Which is amazing. I mean, the majority, and, and you know, they have these amazing storage bunkers where all this stuff is hidden from the light of day. And some of it is down there because it's of, considered of lesser quality. Some of it is there because it's too delicate to see the light of day very often and has to be circulated. But the fact that there's a whole bunch of other art is really interesting and a lot of interesting refer, you know, art that can be used in reference. The other thing that's that, the thing that I think is really a cool story that museums can talk about is conservation. This is really what a lot of museums are about. Museums are about you know, wealthy people who even today have amazing collections. There's no way they can afford to, to sustain those collections over time. So many of them donate them to museums. And the, what museums' primary role is, is to protect and to, to improve and repair and these works of art. So this is, this is a conservation lab, and I think if there's anything that's like CSI, it's the conservation lab. You know, when that work of art came, that Castiglione came in, 
They took it to the conservation, this is after they took it out of storage and right before it went on view. They took it into the conservation lab, they x-rayed it, they discovered, oh, actually Mary's been repainted. She was originally looking up toward the sky, but now she's looking down. They discovered uh, that the artist's signature was on there, which they actually had it kind of attributed to him, but they didn't, weren't really sure, but they found that the artist's signature was there and it had been painted over in some previous project. Um, and then they also just found out that the painting had been repainted over and over again to repair it. So what do they do? They strip all of that away. And, you're, and then what you're left with is a painting that has huge holes in it. And the thing that I think is really interesting about the conservation process is they have a policy, and this is, this is, you know, this is basically the law of conservation, is that you, when you lay down a layer of, of removable varnish over the top of that painting after you take all that paint off, so that when you go back in and you paint over the top of it to, to make it look new again, that all of that is basically kind of like a layer in Photoshop that can easily be turned off so you can say, and this is the real painting underneath. Uh, there's a real interesting standard there as to how that works. I just want to take one second and talk about the, th the, the Chinese figure in the lower right. I just saw that a couple weeks ago at the Art Institute of Chicago. That woman's using an x-ray spect spectrometer to actually try to understand more about the pigments that are used there. That is a thousand-year-old piece of Chinese art. It's been repainted and dozens of times. And they, it's a really interesting story because they're trying to figure out how to restore it. Well, it's been to, to what? They don't really know how to restore it because it's been transformed so many times. And so they basically, it's sitting there and it's been sitting there for, I, I think it's been sitting there for 50 years. And, they're, and all the curators are scratching their heads going, which direction do we take this thing? Again, do we hear these stories? No, we typically don't. We typically see those labels on the wall. This is what we're typically left with. One other thing I want to point out about this painting that I forgot is that this painting has perspective because it was meant to be looked at up high. If you look at it, it's actually stretched out so that it looks correct when you're looking at it from down below. Another relatively high-tech thing. Now, my point is here, if we could tell all these stories about this work of art, we can make it so much more exciting, and you'd probably, there'd be a lot more hands at the, up at the beginning. A couple more things that I think are really interesting untold stories. Fakes and forgeries. Museums deal with these all the time, and a lot of times, the, you know, the fakes, are, the fakes are bought, and everyone thinks they're real. And... And it's not until they go into that conservation lab and they start to do x-rays and they start to look at records that they start to really know. Most works in the, of art in the art museum have what's, well, all of them should have what's called provenance, which is basically the car facts of art. It's supposed to say all the fires it's been in, all the owners that it's had in the past, and provenance is really important. You know, this is one of the Elgin marbles. And, you know, the Elgin marbles are very controversial because they were uh, taken or purchased, depending on who tells the story, uh, when the Turks occupied Rome uh, by Lord Elgin and are now in the British Museum. Well, Greece would like them back. And there are many other stories like this of, of museums that have these works of art. Museums do not like to talk about this. But it's really interesting stuff, and it's stories that would draw more people into the museum if they would actually tell these stories. So coming to conclusion here, media, new media, which is my field, is where we are able to tell these stories. That door into the past and present, those two doors, when I sit and talk to a curator about what I want to do with new media, I talk about cutting those doors in the gallery walls. because they are able to do things that they have never envisioned before. They're trained as scholars, and they talk as scholars, and they talk to scholars, and, they, and that's why those labels read the way they do. But with new, new, new media, everything from iPads to, to uh, mobile devices, we're able to, to really tell those stories in a, in, a, in a new way. The other thing that's happening that's really exciting, and this is the Walker's new website, which I encourage you to all look at, is that there's, there's other voices. And the thing that's really interesting about the Walker's website is the Walker has all of its staff blogging. And that's the most, most 
read stuff on their website by far because the staff is telling about, talking about all these stories. And, it, and it, they're not relying on just this, these labels, but the whole staff is blogging every day about what they're doing and what's interesting. And then at the same time, you've got the public coming in and contributing their thoughts and insights. So I wanted to end with this quote uh, by Paulo Fier, which I think really kind of sums up what I'm talking about, which is, never does an event, a fact, a deed, a gesture of rage or love, a poem, a painting, a song, a book, have one reason behind it. In fact, a deed, a gesture, a poem, a painting, a song, a book, are always wrapped in thick, thick layers. They have been touched by, many, by manifold wise. Only some of these are close enough to the event, the creation, to be visible as wise. And so I have always been more interested in understanding the process in which, by which things come about than the product themselves. I hope this all inspires you to think differently about using the museum in your teaching, as well as just think differently about your teaching in your, your daily lives. Thank you.